Good morning, everyone. Christ is risen. Amen. And it's so good to have James Earl Jones in this congregation this morning. <laughs> Love that voice, brother. <laughs> um, I, I was brought up in a Christian family and uh, became a Christian at the age of 10. Never really questioned my faith until I got to grad school. And then I began to question it in a major way as I finished up. And the reason I started questioning it was I'd just been brought up in a Christian environment my entire life. I was never really exposed to any other worldviews. And I recognized that uh, people of other faiths uh, met, mostly were in the same situation. So how did I know that what I believed was true rather than this is just the way I was raised to believe? Now, I thought I had a relationship with God, but so did people of other faiths for the most part. So again, how did I know that what I believed was true? Um, I used to tell people, well, if you want to know if Christianity is true, just open your Bibles and start reading maybe the Gospel of John and pray and ask God to show you if it's true, and he will. And then Mormons came to my door, and they said, if you want to know if the Book of Mormon is true, uh, just read the Book of Mormon and ask and pray with a sincere heart for God to show you whether it's true, and he will show you it's true. And I got thinking, wow, it's kind of the same thing. Um, Muslims in the Quran says, if you want to know if the Quran is correct, just try to write a chapter like one in the Quran and you'll find that you can't. So, I mean, there's these different kind of truth claims and different tests for them. But I, I'm thinking, how do I know that Christianity is true? If this really involves the eternal destiny of my soul, if it really is that important, I want to know the truth. I don't want to be a Christian just because this is the way I was raised. I want to believe it because it's true. And so I started to think about this, and I, I contacted a friend of my, or, well, he wasn't a friend at the time. He was a professor where I was attending school at Liberty University named Gary Habermas. He was known as a professor who was really approachable, that you could go to him and ask questions and express doubts, and he wouldn't put you down. And um, the reason being is because he had experienced doubts in his life uh, about the Christian faith, and it really worked through them. Gary Habermas has become the leading authority in the world in the resurrection of Jesus. And so um, I asked him about it, and we sat down and talked, and that solved my doubts for the moment. When I got out of graduate school and went into the real world and started bumping into people who weren't Christians, they brought up all sorts of objections, and then my doubts came back. How do I know that this is true? I'm not looking for pat answers, I'm looking for truth. And so back on the phone with Gary Habermas. <laughs> and over the years we had many conversations, and. It's odd for a student and a, a, a teacher to become really good friends. It's, it's rare. It does happen at times. And it just so happened, I don't know if it was just our personalities or what, but we became really good friends. And um, so he got me hooked on the resurrection of Jesus, and I ended up going for a Ph.D. and did my dissertation on the historical evidence for the resurrection. I've since debated, about, uh, had 21 public debates and dialogues, most of them on the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, many of them have been with some of the leading skeptics in North America and around the world. And after 21 of these dialogues, I'm more convinced than ever that Jesus rose from the dead because what skeptics have just doesn't cut it. So, you say, well, what kind of evidence do we have for the resurrection of Jesus? Well, we actually have some pretty good evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, and I'm going to give you a pretty simple argument for it today. In fact, this argument I'm going to give you is so simple that even an LSU graduate can understand. <laughs> um, so, as all of us here in Alabama this morning talk about that, let's uh, dive right into this. I'm going to base this pretty much on just one major fact, and that is that subsequent to Jesus' death, shortly thereafter, his disciples had experience. Uh, they thought was the risen Jesus. In fact, I'm going to just make it even simpler than that. We're just going to have to establish that the disciples claimed that Jesus rose and had appeared to them. That's simple. Just that they made the claims. Now, some skeptics out there would say that the Gospels are complete legend. Some would say that the Gospels are partial legend. Some would say that uh, uh, the Gospels are just not historically reliable. I have lectures I could do on that, but I'll tell you what, we're just going to say, forget the Gospels this morning, we can still establish that uh, the disciples claim that Jesus rose from the dead. And the way that we'll do that is we'll go to the Apostle Paul. And the reason being is because Paul wrote before any of the Gospels. So even though I believe the Gospels are historically reliable biographies of Jesus, 
um, it wouldn't matter even if they weren't, because Paul wrote before the, the Gospels. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which is one of the, the very earliest of the, of the New Testament literature, and although the Gospels are listed first in our New Testament, they weren't written first. The letters of Paul are probably the earliest. Maybe the letter of Hebrews uh, could be early. Maybe James is very early as well. We just don't know the exact dates, but we do know Paul's letters are quite early. And Paul, uh, Jesus was crucified either in 30 or 33 AD. And um, Paul converts to Christianity just a few years afterward. He was a persecutor of the church. He hated the Christians. He hated the church. He wanted to destroy the church. So he was by his very own testimony. He was arresting Christians, having them beaten, having them imprisoned, and having them executed for being Christians. And he thought this was God's will. And then all of a sudden, one day, he had an experience that he was convinced was the risen Jesus appearing to him. And it radically transformed his life from being a persecutor of the church to one of its most able defenders. Now, that is not to say that we can prove historically that Paul saw Jesus. We can prove historically that Paul believed that he saw Jesus. Okay? We can also prove historically that Paul knew Jesus' disciples because Paul says he does. He did. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 11, he says, whether it's what I'm preaching about the resurrection or they, the apostles, this is what we're preaching, the resurrection of Jesus, and this is what you believed. In Galatians chapter 1, Paul said that three years after his conversion, he went up to Jerusalem and he met with Peter, the lead apostle, and also visited with James, the brother of Jesus. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul said that 14 years later, he went back up to Jerusalem and he met with the pillars of the church, Peter, James, and John, to run the gospel message past them to ensure that he was preaching the same thing they were preaching. And he said they verified that his teaching, he was, his teaching was in alignment with theirs. In other words, fist bump, Paul. Good job, brother. Keep up the good work. Now this is what Paul says. And for all we know, historically speaking, Paul could have been lying. So historically, we look for corroborating data. And it just so happens we have some. You see, um, Clement of Rome and Polycarp were probably disciples of the apostles Peter and John, respectively. And we have a letter written by each of them. So if Paul had been teaching a gospel message that was different than Peter and John, we would expect Clement and Polycarp, when they mentioned Paul, to say something perhaps negative about him. What we do find in 1 Clement, uh, Clement places Paul on par with his mentor Peter, and refers to Paul as the blessed Paul. Polycarp quotes from Paul's letters twice, refers to them as part of the sacred scriptures. And then he says, and I quote, Paul accurately and reliably taught the message of truth. Now this is not the kind of things you say about Paul if he's teaching a different gospel message than Peter and John, your, your mentors. It is precisely the thing you say about Paul if he is teaching what your mentors, Peter and John were teaching the very thing that Paul said that Peter and John uh, agreed with his gospel message. We could go even further. I could give you further evidence, but that will have to suffice for now. We do know that Paul was preaching the same gospel message as the Jerusalem apostles. So when we come to 1 Corinthians 15, Paul in verse 1 opens, he says, I want to remind you of the gospel message that I preach to you. Whoa. This is the same gospel message that Paul had verified by the Jerusalem apostles just a few years before. And he's verifying, he's saying, this gospel message, I want to remind you of it. And now he's going to tell us what it is. In verses 3 through 8, Paul says, he gives this ancient creed. He says, I delivered to you what I also received. In other words, I gave to you back in around the year 51 when I established your church here in Corinth. Um, I gave to you a tradition that I had also received from others. He said, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared. Now, here's what's interesting about this. We know it's an oral tradition for a number of reasons. Number one, it says delivered and received, which were two technical terms for the imparting of oral tradition. But also, we know it because... Um, there was, uh, like today, if we were going to give, say, uh, if I said to you, you know, um, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch was like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. 
you would know that that is a hymn or a poem of some sort. Why? Because there's a rhythm to it and because there's a rhyme at the end. Well, the ancients had that kind of stuff too. They just, they, one of their techniques was called parallelism, which would go long, short, long, short. So notice that in this creed. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared. Pretty cool, huh? So this is oral tradition. And then in verses 11, 12, and 14, when Paul refers back to this tradition, he refers to it using the Greek term kerygma, which we use the term kerygma in English, which means official and formal proclamation, public proclamation. So, in other words, this is what Paul, he's given them the official and formal public proclamation of Jesus' apostles here on what happened to Jesus. And he says, Christ died for our sins according to scriptures, he was buried, he was raised on the third day according to scriptures, and that he appeared. And then he lists six resurrection appearances of Jesus. To Peter, to the twelve, to more than five hundred at one time, to James, to all the apostles, and then Paul says, last of all, he mentions himself. So three individual appearances, three group appearances. We'll get back to those in a moment. But this is the apostolic preaching right here. Jesus died, was buried, was raised, and he appeared to individuals and groups. So we can firmly establish that the disciples claimed that Jesus had appeared. And we've looked at the literature. Um, I've looked at it since 1985, the academic literature. Um, and I, I can't find a single scholar single skeptical scholar who would say that Jesus' disciples did not claim that he had been raised and had appeared to them. Now, the skeptical scholars don't believe they actually saw Jesus, but they will at least acknowledge that they claimed that Jesus had been raised and had appeared to them. Now, this is where our simple logic comes in uh, for a, a simple uh, case for the resurrection that you will be able to take home with you and even if you go out to lunch today and you get in a conversation with your waitress or waiter, you will be able to give them a short historical case for the resurrection of Jesus. All right? And you may not even have to take notes in order to do it. That's how simple this is. All right? Do you like that? All right. Here we go. It's real simple. The disciples claim Jesus appeared. He either appeared to them or he did not appear to them. Can you think of any other option? No. I can't either. This is in logic they call it the law of excluded middle. There is no other option here. Let's investigate the, the option for a moment that they claim that Jesus appeared to them, but he did not actually appear to them. All right? So, in this case, they either knew that he did not appear to them, or they did not know that he appeared to them. Can you think of any other option? So they either believed that he appeared to them, or they did not believe it. All right, let's consider the option for a moment that they did not know. In other words, they claimed that he appeared to them, but he didn't, and they didn't know it. In other words, they believed it. Only real option there is a hallucination of some sort. What would have led them to believe it? It was a hallucination. Well, as my colleague Sean White was talking about in the, in the Sunday School Hour, um, hallucinations are just not a good option. Believe it or not, though, it's the most popular option put forth by skeptical scholars today. They will call it hallucinations, or they will call it visions, or they will call it an, um, an, exper an altered state of experience within an altered state of consciousness. Either way you look at it, they're thinking hallucinations. Because a hallucination is a perception of something that is not really there. So you could see something, hear something, smell something, taste something, uh, feel like touch something, or have a sensation that you're in motion. But it's, it's not, what, whatever's going is not there. So you wake up in the morning because you had a sensation you were falling. That's called a kinesthetic hallucination. We all have those, don't we? All right? We all have hallucinations of some sort. Um, usually it's, uh, you experience it in a single mode, so you don't usually see and hear something. Uh, people who are on drugs and schizophrenics will have multiple mode hallucinations, but usually you only have it in a single mode. Um, so the people most likely to experience a hallucination are sing uh, senior adults bereaving the loss of a loved one. In fact, we lost my mom last July, and about a week ago today, my dad experienced a visual hallucination of my mom. Um, thought he saw her in the living room. Thought he saw her uh, smile, wink, and wave at him. 
Um, so about 50% of senior adults bereaving the loss of a loved one experience a hallucination of that loved one of some sort. The most common is they just sense their presence in the room. They don't see them, they don't hear them, they just sense they're in the room. Of the 50%, 39% of them experience that sort of hallucination. But of the 50% who experience a hallucination, only 14% experience a visual hallucination of that person like my dad. In other words, only 7% of all senior adults for even a loss of a loved one experience a visual hallucination and that is the group most likely to experience a hallucination. So when we come to the disciples, what do we have? We have in that creed from 1 Corinthians 15, he appeared to the 12. What percentage is that? 100%. He appeared to all of the apostles. That's what he says as well. What percentage is all? 100%. So that means that it was probably not a hallucination because the percentage of people who experienced it was way too high. Moreover, in that creed, in 1 Corinthians 15, there are three group appearances to the 12, to more than 500, and to all of the apostles. And yet we know from modern psychology that group hallucinations are extremely rare, if not impossible. Now, several years ago, I lived in Virginia Beach, and half of the Navy SEALs live in Virginia Beach, the other half in San Diego area. I got to know many of those SEALs. And uh, they took me up to their obstacle course. Those guys are in amazing shape. Um, they have, there's a junior obstacle course, there's a senior obstacle course. The Navy SEALs have to do both, and they'll do 13 laps through those. I couldn't do one lap through the junior course. <laughs> These guys will get up in the morning, they will go out into the Chesapeake Bay there, they will swim three miles, get out of the water, put on their sneakers, and run seven miles, all before breakfast. Um, so these guys are in tremendous shape. In order to become a SEAL, they had to go through what's called Hell Week out in San Diego. They don't, they, it's very intense, and it's there for mental and physical toughness, and they would go through this. They start Sunday night, and they go through around noon on Saturday morning. They only get about three hours of sleep the entire week. Not every night, but the entire week. They just do amazing things. Um, well, because of the sleep deprivation and the stress, probably from those I spoke with, um, probably 80% of them experienced a hallucination of some sort. And they were usually visual hallucinations. And they were usually, when they were doing this exercise called Around the World, where they race in these rafts um, to go out into the ocean, circle this buoy, and come back. And the, the team that does it and gets back first gets to sit out and rest the next rest, race. So they're really trying hard. Well, because they're working hard, but their mind is just allowed to go, they experience hallucinations a lot during this time. One said he saw, told me he saw, thought he saw a train coming right at the raft. And he told the guys in the raft, and they said, you idiot, there's no trains out here on the Pacific Ocean. But he believed it so much that he rolled out of the raft to avoid being hit by the train. They had to stop, pick this guy up, and of course they didn't win that race. Um, Another guy said he saw an octopus come out of the water and wave at him. Another guy told me he didn't see any hallucinations, but he distinctly remembers another guy in the raft taking his paddle and just swinging it wildly in the air. And when they said, what are you doing? He says, I'm trying to hit these dolphins that are jumping over the raft. Did you see any dolphins? Nope. Did anyone else? Nope. They were having their own hallucinations. So the, the thing there is you can all be in the frame of mind most of you could even be experiencing hallucination, but you're not going to experience the same hallucination. All right, because hallucinations are in the mind of an indi individual. You can't participate in another person's hallucination. They're like dreams in that way. All right? So, um, and hallucinations would not account for the appearance of Paul because Paul was not grief stricken. Paul was glad Jesus was dead. Jesus would have been the last person in the world that Paul would have expected or wanted to see. So hallucinations just simply cannot account for the historical data we have. It cannot account for why the disciples believe or claim that Jesus had appeared to them. So, now we look at another option. The disciples claim that Jesus appeared to them, he didn't appear to them, and they knew it. We have two options. Um, they knew it, and, and, that, and it's because they lied, or they knew he didn't appear to them, but they were using resurrection merely as a metaphor 
for some other message. So let's look at both of these. Did they lie? We have no less than 11 ancient sources that report that the disciples were willing to suffer, and, and Paul, the disciples were willing to suffer and die, uh, even die for their beliefs that Jesus had been raised. Now, um, you may not remember this part, but I mean, just to list some of these for you, um, you've got Luke, Tertullian, John, um, uh, Dionysius of Corinth, Origen, Polycarp, Ignatius, and Clement of Rome. They all mentioned the disciples willing to suffer and die. Uh, now, we don't know that all of them were martyred for their faith. We do know that Peter and uh, Paul and James, the brother of Jesus, were for sure. But we do know that all of them were willing to die. Um, the rest may have died as martyrs. We just don't know because the reports about them are quite late. But we have early reports and multiple independent reports that tell us that Peter, James, the brother of Jesus, and Paul all died as Christian martyrs. And we also have these other sources that mention how the disciples did suffer continuously for their belief, their gospel proclamation that Jesus had been raised. And uh, liars pay, make poor martyrs, don't they? Now you say, well, wait a minute, Muslims are willing to die for their beliefs. Yes, they are. Christians today are willing to die for their beliefs. Yes, they are. Some of you are old enough. Uh, I'm, I'll be 53 in a couple of months. You remember during the Vietnam War how there was that Buddhist monk who doused himself in gasoline and set himself on fire in order in protest of the war. So Buddhist people of all different beliefs are willing to die for their beliefs. Yes, that doesn't prove that their beliefs are true. Agreed. However, it proved that they sincerely believe what they're dying for is true. Muslim terrorists aren't told to do what they do and they think, hmm, let me think about this. Muhammad was a pro false prophet, the Quran is not divinely inspired, and if I kill all these innocent people, I'm going straight to hell. Sign me up. That's not what's going on. They die because they sincerely believe Islam is true. But the, one other thing I'd point out, there is a difference between Muslims and Christians and Hindus and Buddhists who die for their beliefs today and the disciples. The disciples died for what they either knew was true or false, right? Today, Muslims and Christians and others die for what they believe is true, but cannot know with 100% certainty. We are believing based on the testimony of others. The disciples were believing based on what they either saw or did not see. And again, liars make poor martyrs. So, did they, were they lying? The fact that they were all willing to suffer continuously and die for their faith uh, strongly suggests that they sincerely believed what they were saying was true. Okay? So, it wasn't a lie. But what about a metaphor? He didn't appear, they claimed he appeared to them, he didn't appear to them, they knew it, but they really didn't mean that Jesus had been raised from the dead. They were using it as a metaphor to say something like, well, by resurrection we mean his memory and teachings live on today. When we take the Eucharist, the, the last supper, and, and celebrate communion, it means that Jesus makes his presence known to us as we remember him in the blessed Eucharist. Or maybe it means, as some would say, uh, it was a metaphor to mean that God had vindicated Jesus in heaven as he had done also with the Jewish martyrs before him. So Jesus was just the most recent person to step in line of the Jewish martyrs and God had exalted them by taking them to heaven and vindicating their teachings. What about that? One problem, we, we, we have a couple problems with that. Number one, it doesn't appear that that's what the Christians meant. Because we look at how the enemies, the critics of Christianity, interpreted the Christians. You had people, <coughs> excuse me, like um, Matthew in his gospel, uh, uh, chapter 28, he said, the Jewish leaders were going around saying the disciples had stolen the body of Jesus. What does that mean? It means the disciples, that's a response to the disciples claiming Jesus had been raised and the tomb was empty, right? Later on, Justin Martyr, around the year 150, said that the Jewish leaders were still spreading the same lie. The disciples had stolen the body. You had Tertullian around the year 200, and he said that, um, uh, that the gardener had reburied the body of Jesus. Um, so, in order to avoid visitors from stepping on his lettuce patch. We can call that the Caesar salad hypothesis. 
So um, in order to avoid them stepping on his salad, they, um, they, the gardener reburied the body. All right, but what is that saying? It's trying to explain an empty tomb, right? Or Celsus, in the, toward the end or the middle of the, the, the second century, Celsus said that Jesus faked his death. He faked his death. We'll look at that one more in a moment. Um, but what does that say? It, it's saying that Jesus didn't die. It's saying that the to, it's trying to give a reason for why the tomb was empty. In other words, all of this is to combat um, uh, the alternate, alternate hypotheses of the critics who, who were saying, all right, you're saying Jesus was raised physically. No, we're saying the disciples stole the body, the gardener reburied the body, Jesus faked his death and came out of the tomb. It's, it's all answering literal claims that Jesus was raised physically from the dead. Also notice how the Christians respond to this. They didn't say, oh, whoa, 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 back up, guys. You misunderstood us. We're not really meaning by this that Jesus was really raised. That's theological yuck, as John Dominic Crossan would say. Jesus really wasn't raised. We're just saying this as a metaphor for Jesus' teachings lives on. Come celebrate with us and, and feel his presence as we worship him together. Um, so that's not how the Christians responded. They said, no, guys, the disciples did not, we did not, the disciples did not steal the body. Um, and Jesus was actually raised. They defended the historicity of the resurrection. But even more telling is, let's look at what the earliest Christians did claim. Back to 1 Corinthians 15, Paul speaks and he's talking about the resurrection and he's addressing those in the Corinthian church who said, were claiming that there is no resurrection of the dead. And he said, really guys? Well, guess what? You're saying if there's no resurrection of the dead, that means Jesus wasn't raised from the dead. And if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins because Jesus did not die for your sins. You are still in your sins. And those who have died as Christians, you're never going to see them again because they have forever perished. And he said, listen, if Christ is not raised, then the dead aren't going to be raised on the final day. Christians are not going to experience the general resurrection. And if that's the case, why did I, why have I fight, why did I fight the wild beast in Ephesus? He says, look, if, if the dead aren't raised, let's eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Party today. There is no tomorrow. We have no God to fear. Let's go out and just enjoy life now. Get all the ice cream we can. Get it now. Live for today because when we die tomorrow, there is nothing to look forward to. If Christ has not been raised, the dead aren't raised. In other words, and then Paul goes to say, but Christ has been raised. So Paul and the apostles who were teaching the same thing are basing the truth of Christianity, they're basing our future eternal life on whether Jesus was actually raised. It's not a metaphor. And if Jesus was just another in line of the Jewish martyrs, then Paul would not have said in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, that Christ is the first fruits of the dead. No, Jesus was the first to be raised with a resurrection body. Make no mistake about it. It is an airtight case. The disciples of Jesus claimed that Jesus rose from the dead, and they really meant that he rose from the dead. It was not a metaphor. So if they knew that he had not been raised from the dead, they are, as Paul said, liars. Because they were saying that God had raised Jesus from the dead. But the fact that they were willing to die and suffer continuously for these beliefs. And the Romans didn't do lethal injection. They had other ways of killing people that were not pleasant. Um, so if they were all willing to suffer continuously and willing to die for their proclamation that Jesus was raised from the dead. They had to really believe it. That leaves us with another option. So we can rule out here that he didn't appear to them, period. We know that Jesus appeared to them. That leaves two options. Jesus never died and he appeared to them alive again. Or Jesus died and he rose again and appeared to them. Let's consider the option that he didn't die. So we're saying here that Jesus was crucified and then he was taken off the cross, but they thought he was dead. He really wasn't. They put him in the tomb. Somehow he was revived by the coolness of the tomb. 
um, or maybe some people came in and administered some medication to him. Um, uh, aloe, frankincense, all these kinds of things that healed him. Um, and um, he came forth, he was alive, and they proclaimed his resurrection from the dead. What about that possibility? Well, we have to, uh, by the way, there's hardly any scholars, it's very difficult to find any scholars who would even take this view today. Uh, there's one named Barbara Tiering, um, who, uh, not, she has a PhD, but not too many people really respect her scholarship on these things. She's probably the only scholar in the, in the world, and I really mean this, the only scholar in the world who would say that Jesus survived his death, um, recuperated, uh, took Mary Magdalene to be his wife, went off to France and had children. Uh, and she's, uh, as far as I know, the only scholar in the world who says that, and nobody gives her any attention. It's kind of like the early episodes of American Idol when they get on here and they sing and think they're doing a great job and everybody's like, yeah, all right. Um, well, that's kind of how they look at that hypothesis that Jesus survived death and a number of reasons why. Um, the process of crucifixion was extremely brutal. Um, it was difficult to survive crucifixion. Um, after the scourging, the, the way crucifixion worked, you could tell when a person was dead because when you're on the cross, you were quite active. You would push up in order to expel uh, excess carbon dioxide and then you would go back down. And that's why they would break your legs. So you couldn't push up anymore. You'd stay down in this position, you would go into painful convulsions and die. I've spoken to physicians on this, uh, people who have treated uh, 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 soldiers injured in battle. Uh, my physician friend told me that if a person's in that down position, not breathing for, and they're, and they're like unconscious for five minutes, they're not coming back to life. They couldn't even bring them back to life with modern medical technology. There's only one account of an, in, in antiquity of a person surviving crucifixion. The Jewish historian Josephus in the first century reported that at the time of the fall of Jerusalem around the year 70, Josephus saw three of his friends who had been crucified. So Josephus went to his, fr his friend, the Roman commander Titus, asked him for a favor to save his friends. Com uh, Titus commanded that all three of his friends be removed from their crosses and provided the best medical care Rome had to offer. In spite of this, two of the three still died. So even if Jesus had been removed from his cross and provided the best medical care Rome had to offer, his chances of surviving were still very small. But to complicate things, we don't have any evidence whatsoever, no reports at all, ever, that Jesus was removed intentionally or that he was provided any medical care whatsoever, much less Rome's best. The only one who even suggests it would be Celsus in the middle of the second century. Um, so, and imagine, oh, and by the way, historians have to go with not possibilities, historians go with probabilities. And since that's only that one account that we have that even suggests that Jesus faked his death, we have to look at the, the effects of crucifixion and we have to look at not what's possible, but what's probable. Finally, imagine what Jesus would have looked like. He's scourged, he's crucified, and let's say they were able to get him up and around somehow after just a day and a half. What would he look like when he came to his disciples? Can you imagine? Here he is hunched over in his pathetic and mutilated state, wounds still weeping, and they look at him. They would not say, wow, I can't wait to have a resurrection body just like yours. They would have said, let's get you a doctor. You need some serious help, Jesus. It would not have convinced the disciples that Jesus was raised from the dead. Alive, yes. Raised, not a chance. So, the hypothesis that Jesus appeared to them because he was not dead, had never died, doesn't work. That leaves us with one other option. And that is that Jesus' disciples claimed that he had appeared to them. He appeared to them. And the reason he appeared to them is because he was raised from the dead. It's the only logical option that is left. And when we consider that Jesus predicted his death, that he claimed to be God's uniquely divine son, that he came because God had chosen him to usher in his kingdom, and that brings salvation to us, and that we can have salvation through him and him alone, it makes a whole lot more sense that it's within this context that we would have such evidence for a resurrection. 
What does this mean for us today? Of course it means forgiveness of sins. We live in a world of great darkness, don't we? Moral darkness, spiritual darkness. We see it some here in the United States. We see it in things like human trafficking and many other things. But you know, it's, it's even more prevalent overseas. The evil in this world is just terrible. And what the resurrection tells us is that God's going to make everything right in the end. It means that when we die, it's not going to be uh, that justice isn't done. It's not going to be that there's not going to be any mercy. It's not going to be that we can't get forgiveness of sins. It's not going to be that when we die, that is it. It doesn't mean that when someone like my mom dies last year that I'm never going to see her again. It doesn't mean that when your loved ones die that you're not going to see them again or when you pass away that you just cease to exist. If you have cancer now and you've been given a year, my dad was given a year to live a couple weeks ago. His, his body's just riddled with cancer. You know, but he's got the assurance of eternal life. It's not that um, we have Christianity and belief in the resurrection and the afterlife as a psychological crutch. And that's why we believe. No, not at all. It's the fact that Jesus rose from the dead and that we have such assurance, historical uh, uh, confidence that he actually rose from the dead, that we can have confidence and comfort when we know we only have a few days left or we know that our loved ones are going to pass away. Um, we can have that assurance because Jesus rose from the dead. It's not just a matter of blind faith. We've got some really good historical evidence for this. So whether you've lost a loved one, whether you have a terminal disease, whether you uh, have lost your job, whether your family has just, relationships have just blown up, you're going through some financial struggles, whatever it is, you can take comfort. The resurrection occurred. Sunday is here. It's just a matter of time. We're here on earth. It's a testing ground for us. It's a, it's a ground where uh, God wants to develop in us the character of Christ. His goal for us is not our happiness. It's our holiness. And when we keep that in mind and recognize that our trials that we're going through make sense in light of him molding us into being more like his son Jesus, it makes a whole lot more sense. And when we realize the resurrection of Jesus assures us eternal life, it's a lot easier to get through those trials. If I hated my job and I won the lottery and I put in my two-week notice, I could take anything from my boss, couldn't I? making me work late, belittling me in front of the other, other employees. It wouldn't matter what my boss made me do. I could endure it because I only got two weeks left. Once we're in eternity, once we pass from this life until the next, two seconds into eternity, nothing that we endure unpleasant here on earth is going to matter, is it? Because we got eternity. We got eternity in heaven with the Lord and, his, and our loved ones. And that is something to celebrate on this Easter. We can have this confidence because we've got the evidence to back it. May the Lord bless every one of you on this Easter. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the resurrection of Jesus. Thank you that Friday wasn't the end of things. And that we can celebrate your coming back to life today. Thank you that you did this for us nearly 2,000 years ago. And Lord, may we continue to keep this in mind as we live out the rest of our lives to endure through the hardships. And Lord, as we share your glorious gospel with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters, stand for the benediction.